a distressing number of extensions are covertly in the business of spying on you and selling the data. We probably all use browser extensions, whether it's a coupon code extension, something that checks your grammar, or a password manager. Well, I hope you really trust whoever runs it, because extensions can be a lot more dangerous than people realize. Conventional wisdom says just check the permissions of an extension before installing it. But if you were shown those permissions, would you really understand what they meant? In this video, we're going to look at extension permissions under a microscope and explain what each one means. We'll look specifically at the most dangerous extension ever made. Maybe. It was an extension deliberately designed to be able to do all kinds of nefarious things. But the thing is, when you look at each permission that it's requesting, you'll see that they're not so different from the permissions that your current extensions are probably also requesting. All that's different is the trust you're placing in the developers not to abuse those permissions. We also uncover the sketchy marketplace for extensions that no one talks about, where extensions that have lots of users are purchased and repurposed to collect data and do all kinds of nefarious things. So let's start by understanding what browser extensions are and what some of their permissions actually mean. A browser extension is a small piece of software that adds functionality or features to a web browser. They're designed to enhance the user experience or extend the capabilities of the browser. Browser extensions interact with web browsers by using a set of special communication rules called APIs that allow the extension to change or improve how you view and interact with web pages. They're strictly controlled APIs, which in theory means that they have specific limitations in place to ensure that the extension is safe and secure for users. But in reality, extensions are basically limited only by a developer's imagination. You'll come across APIs and you'll be like, really? Like you can just take a screenshot whenever you want. Matt Frisbee is the author of Building Browser Extensions, and it was writing this book that first gave him insight into the power of extensions to be used for good and bad. It really began when I was kind of putting together the material for my book. And so that involves going through all the APIs and see what they do. The best way to see what an API does is to actually use it in the creation of an extension. In the process of doing that, um, it was a little bit unsettling. There's lots of opportunities to use these for bad. He ultimately wanted to show how easy it is to make a malicious extension. But the scary thing about this experiment is that Matt isn't using special tools to steal people's data. He's using the same APIs that every extension uses. He's just showing how easily they can be abused. While this experiment was never intended for actual malicious purposes, the takeaway is clear. The difference between having login credentials stolen and installing a legitimate, useful app is often just whether or not the developer can be trusted to not abuse their permissions. If you don't know enough about an extension's creator, owner, and purpose, it can be really dangerous for your digital life. Matt's ground rules in this experiment were that he had to make his extension look legitimate enough to hypothetically fool someone into installing it. I'm trying to fly under the radar, so I wanted don't want to do anything that's going to you know, make them suspicious. There could be no extra console warnings, no visual indicators that anything was amiss, and the extension itself had to be disguised as something benign. The facade you created for this extension, it's a note-taking app. A simple extension that lots of people would install without looking twice at. Once he had the disguise sorted, he had to think about how to handle permissions. When you install an extension that asks for a bunch of permissions, it's unavoidable that you get this big pop-up. If we can just get them to click OK once, then we can do whatever we want. Luckily. Everyone just clips through the warnings and no one really pays attention to them. This is because people don't usually understand the permission that they're being shown. It's very difficult for a user to be able to tell, like, this is a good extension and it's asking for permission that it absolutely needs versus this is a bad extension that is going to use this for bad purposes. So we've become accustomed to just clicking yes to permissions by default. But what if, for his extension, Matt asked for every possible permission? A prompt box that filled the entire page might raise some red flags, right? Not necessarily. For the purposes of the piece, I requested a comical number of permissions, all of them. But instead of a glaring warning telling you that you're about to install the world's most dangerous extension designed to steal as much data as possible, you might only have been shown this modest pop-up. It neatly cuts off below five permissions. Five 
messages for for an extension would not be crazy. Um, I think most people would not look twice at that. The user should have seen dozens of permissions, but due to the fact that Mac OS X hides their scroll bar, you would never know they're there. If you can't see the permissions and there's no indication that they're there, it's a huge security problem. So the first lesson here, when installing something, be careful that there aren't permissions that you just can't see. Let's say you could see every permission. Would you really understand what each one means? To understand extension permissions, let's first look at the components that can make up an extension. There are three specific ones that really stand out as being potentially more dangerous than others. Background service workers, which perform background tasks, pop-up pages for user interaction, and content scripts for modifying web pages. So these are the three pieces that are the most useful for the purposes of stealing data. Let's start with the background service workers. The background script is a service worker that's, as the name would suggest, running in the background. Think of running in the background as the opposite of having a user interface. A web page, that's a user interface. The pop-up window, that's a user interface. When none of those exist, the extension still needs to do things, load code. The service worker is simply a container to run code, it's also a very useful place to do bad things. It's all hidden from the user with no visual indication that there's code running, and you can't really inspect its network activity. Checking the network activity of a normal website is easy. Open the developer console of any given website and choose the network tab, you're able to see all the network traffic coming in out of the website. All traffic from the background worker does not show up in there because it's not from the web page. A background worker's network activity for extensions is really hard to get to. You have to go into the Chrome extensions page, you have to open a separate developer tools menu. It's a very, very simple way of sending traffic and hiding it from the user because they're never going to find it. The next component of extensions that we'll mention is pop-ups, which are useful for certain tasks that need a user interface. The pop-up is one of the native user interfaces that extensions can use. It renders an extension web page every time, so that's your user interface. There are certain activities that can only be performed with a user interface, so pop-ups are a handy tool. The final component we'll mention is a content script. Which is kind of the worst offender. This allows you to inject JavaScript and CSS into the page. What does this mean in practical terms? You can use that to build something that paints on top of the page, make modifications to the page, whatever. There are really no limits. This is really where you can gather the most information out of the page. You can also set listeners for anything the user is doing. So keystrokes, mouse movements, reading inputs, the limit is really your imagination. That's the component that can really do the most damage. Now that we understand what some of the powerful building blocks of extensions are, let's dive into specific permissions. What are some of the worst offenders on here that we should be worried about? Do I have to just pick one? Um, <laughs> let's start with the history permission. What does this mean? The browser will happily dump out your history as, a, as an array. Like this is your browsing history, you visited these websites, we can you know, build this profile of you. So literally, the extension gets full access to your browsing history and can use that data how they want. Then there's the cookie permission. If you call this single line of JavaScript, it dumps out a list of all your cookies and all the domains they're associated with. That's how our browsers authenticate with servers. If someone steals your cookies, they can pretend to be you in all sorts of nasty ways. That's how hackers took over Linus Tech Tips YouTube account. They didn't need to steal his password or 2FA. They just stole his cookies. Next, screen captures. There are actually a number of APIs that an extension can use to capture your desktop and capture the current page you're looking at. And all of these will incur a pop-up, for example, it'll say, you know, which window do you want or which desktop screen do you want? But there's also a third capture option, tab capture. The capture visible tab API is no warning and it just, it takes a screen grab and sends it off and you will never know what's happening. Let's say you can detect they're on a banking website. I could take a screenshot every second and send that off. That's quite a permission. Next, the web request permission. You can basically sniff the request going to every website and see what it's sending. It doesn't matter if it's HTTPS. It's basically a man in the middle and it can see everything you're sending. So stripe.com, like their security is immaculate. It doesn't matter. I can see what you're sending to stripe.com. Anything that's watching 
traffic, especially the payloads, that's pretty damaging. It's all plain text and they can just read it right out of there. You would see all your credit card information, address, password, username, of all the things I put here, this is probably the most offensive vector. What about the web navigation permission? This API is a real-time feed of wherever you're navigating. It's grabbing the top level details of basically where you went on the page. Like, I type in google.com and hit enter. Google.com is the top level domain. So the extension would collect that and any website you navigate to. This is the first of the APIs that's actually capturing everything you do in real time. It's adding just a little JavaScript handler every time the page uh, visits a URL. Now let's look at key loggers. This one's super easy because this one you don't actually need any permissions. Yep, you heard that right. You don't need a special key logger permission to use one. This is the first that only requires a content script. This is just a tiny piece of JavaScript that you're running on the page. This content script, technically called a host permission, would create a pop-up that says, allow this extension to read everything on say google.com. If you're adding an extension that does something fun to your Google search results, of course it's gonna run on google.com. Really, it's able to see everything you're doing on google.com. All the things you're searching, all your keystrokes, everything. It would send them to our background script. Background script sends them to our server. None of that requires any permissions other than the ability to run this script on google.com. It's incredibly dangerous and very easy to do. Then there's input capturing, which happens inside another content script. This is pretty similar to the keylogger. This one can be used for logging things like password manager inputs, where they autofill your login credentials automatically. Those might not be registered as keystrokes. So as a malicious actor, I still want that data. So instead I'm going to watch anytime an input changes, which is a login box, search bar, credit card entry, whatever. Anytime they change, I want to capture what's changed. So even if you're being safer in other ways by using a password manager, a malicious extension that's capturing inputs would be able to see these private details. Clipboard capturing is yet another way to capture user activity, but it prompts a dialogue box that would warn the user. This is actually one of the few wins for how browsers should work. Warnings for such data collection are important. This permission allows extensions to see anything copied to your clipboard. For example, your browser doesn't usually show your saved passwords by default. It will hide them. And if you want to copy them, you would just click a copy button without having to reveal the password on the page. An extension with the C clipboard permission would be able to see the password that you've just copied. But as mentioned, this permission would generate a warning for the user that this was happening. If a malicious actor wanted to see what you're copying more sneakily, there are some workarounds. If you were to use your mouse and grab a bunch of text, the browser can see what you've selected. And then with my content script, I can go, okay, let's just grab that text. Geolocation capturing is a tricky activity to perform because there are some restrictions in place around how location can be collected. The only place that I can get geolocation is in a real user interface. This means a background worker can't collect geolocation without the user's knowledge, but an extension can render a real user interface in the form of a pop-up and then it can collect your location. So I click to take a note. If I have the geolocation permission, I can read where you are every time you open the pop-up. But there's another sneakier way an extension can get a user's geolocation. If they visit a website that already has the geolocation permission, it is actually possible to piggyback off the page's permissions. It really shouldn't work that way. To do this, it uses a content script. Let's say I have a content script that can run on all Google domains. So if the user goes to maps.google.com and they've previously said maps.google.com can read my location, then the extension running on that page can say, oh, they already have geolocation permission. I don't need to prompt the user again. I can piggyback on that permission and then grab their location additionally no pop-ups generated. Hulu, for example, they require your location. Every time they go to hulu.com, great. I don't need to ask them. I can grab their location. The piggybacking of the permissions is an especially disturbing one. Not hard to think of ways that this could be abused. There are other permissions that an extension can piggyback on. Lots of sites say, can I show notifications? And I always go, no, you can't show notifications. If you said yes to it anywhere, that would be another one that the extensions API could theoretically piggyback on. So be careful of granting permissions in general because they can be abused in ways that you hadn't realized. While we've covered more straightforward uses of these APIs and permissions, there are countless creative uses. Let's take open Opening tabs, for example, this is a normal, common thing for extensions to do. The problem is that 
the user can very easily see a new tab is being opened. So someone malicious might want to do something sneakier. Matt came up with a creative workaround he called Stealth Tabs that would allow extensions to send you to any web page without you even knowing. Right now on my browser, I can see I have 30 tabs open probably, and I'm not really paying attention to any of them. Browsers usually unmount these idle tabs, meaning pausing those that you haven't used in a while. If it decides that it's an idle tab, it'll stop running JavaScript on the page to save on battery, to save on system resources. If you click into it, it'll, it'll bring it back up. I'm sure lots of people have all these pause tabs just sitting there. It turns out an extension can identify one of these tabs that seems to be paused, hijack it, and repurpose it. It spoofs what the tab originally looked like, i.e. the little icon and name, so that to a user, nothing seems to change. They'll never see that we just swapped out their tab and it looks identical. It could send you to all kinds of malicious sites or collect your geolocation. The user would have no idea. It's a tab that we control that the user didn't open and we can do whatever we want. I can do it right in front of their eyes and they'll never know that I'm I'm opening up new tab pages. What if the user clicks back into this tab? The tab can see that they've clicked into it and goes, oh no, we gotta leave. So it'll just go back to whatever the original page was totally silently. The user would never know it because you know they would think, oh, it just refreshed or is you know an idle page or whatever. It looks totally normal. It's a pretty creative solution to doing stuff without the user's knowledge. Extensions can be pretty scary once you start to understand what these permissions really mean. There are no zero days being used. There's no exploits here. It's all stuff that's officially supported by the Web Extensions API. It should not be this easy to exploit things. And there's all kinds of other dangers to consider too. For example, extensions can update their code remotely. This means that the code you thought you installed could be replaced with something else without you knowing. It's a real problem. There's not enough being done to address it. For example, after ChatGPT was released earlier this year, an extension called ChatGPT for Google was released. It put ChatGPT results right next to your Google search results. Awesome. Open source, everyone loved it, got to a million installs right away. It was then acquired, no mention of who bought it, and the code was no longer open sourced. What about its million users who are letting this extension see all of their Google activity? They have no idea that it's been purchased. There's no notification that ownership has changed. Any changes in code, adding trackers, whatever it is, they're never going to know. And everything just keeps moving. So as long as the user interface stays the same, uh, all this happened silently. We have no clue what, if any, changes were made to that particular extension. But the purchase and repurpose of extensions without the user knowing? That happens very often, and there's no protection against it. That disturbs me. The extension marketplace is a seedy world that no one really talks about. Matt stumbled upon it when he launched an earlier extension that he'd made. It got a pretty good number of users, and you know, I started to get inbound of people wanting to buy it. They don't really explain what they want it for. This happens to everyone that has a well-used extension. What's wrong with this? There's no revenue, right? It's, it's, it's a free product. So what are they using it for? And I think the unspoken conclusion there is that they're using it for bad purposes and they're sort of selling the data or stealing it in worst cases or like injecting ads or whatever it is. You can get a pretty good payout if you have a lot of users. Those are the extensions that people want to buy. There's this um, whole underground industry. If it has access to Facebook, Someone goes in and goes, oh, I can steal the Facebook data of 100,000 people's users? Let's, let's send them an offer, why not? This underground extension market sheds light on how a lot of extensions are being used as data collection tools. You might have installed something legitimate, but it's since changed hands and is being used for a completely different purpose. So what's the takeaway here? Should people not use extensions at all? Not necessarily. Password managers and ad blockers are very, very powerful tools for consumer privacy. I think everyone should use them. They are going to have to request dangerous APIs. The ones that I use are from reputable sources. And that's the key. Just like with any software, make sure you trust the makers of that software before installing anything. Let's take reputable extensions like uBlock Origin and Privacy Badger. There's a good reason to trust projects like that, that are you know built with consumer protection in mind, um, and are reputable. There's a very well-known developer that maintains it. It's got a huge open source community. So there are definitely good extensions that can help protect you. But a quick aside about such blocker extensions. If you think that installing them is gonna protect you against other malicious extensions, think again. An extension cannot intercept traffic from another extension. They can only operate on traffic that's coming from 
web pages. So the best protection against bad extensions is going to be you asking some important questions before installing anything. Who owns your extensions? Are they being maintained? Where's the money coming from? Extensions in the App Store aren't going to look obviously dangerous. They're going to try their best to blend in. While Matt's experimental dangerous extension may have requested a million permissions. You don't need all of these permissions to do something bad, right? You need maybe one or two. So as if you have an extension that appears legitimate, requires those one or two permissions, and outwardly says, I'm using these in a legitimate way, then it is very likely that a reviewer would not look into it further. And don't just trust something because it's open source. Even if someone says, well, here is our code on GitHub. You can say it's open source till you're blue in the face. There's no guarantee that that is actually the code that's winding up in the browsers. The consumer has no idea what they're installing, really. I think that's the... That's the long and short of it. Installing some fun extension to your browser can seem enticing, but... If you're really concerned about your data, data privacy, I would suggest not testing the waters. So the takeaways. Use limited extensions. Just like with any software, be careful what you install and make sure you absolutely trust it. We need to empower users to know what they're doing. And if you can use in-browser features instead of extensions for some things, that could be one way to decrease your attack surface rather than installing an extension with dubious origin or ownership. Extensions are powerful tools that can be used for good and bad. Be careful which ones you let into your digital life. NBTV is funded by community donations. If you'd like to help us keep making these free educational videos, please visit nbtv.media slash support and let us know if you'd like to be added to our supporter wall. We also have a book called Beginner's Introduction to Privacy, which also supports our channel. Thanks for spreading the word about these videos and for watching through till the end. This video has ended. Watch one of these ones now.